morning and thank you for joining me on the path to liberty. It's Monday, February 22nd, 2021. And today I'm talking about the police state, but more specifically how federal state joint law enforcement task forces, and there are a ton of them, are creating a de facto and an unconstitutional national police state right before our very eyes. I've got an overview of what they are, how they operate, and some of the tricks that they play with support from the federal court system to evade responsibility for following the Constitution or not following the Constitution, really, more likely. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific Time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage has everything you need to follow this program. It's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty, all spelled out. There you're going to find all the archives for over two and a half years. Individual episodes like this one today, I'm going to include a bunch of links to articles that I'm referencing so you can read and learn more on your own time. I'm just scratching the surface, but hopefully you're interested in getting more information. I'll include a bunch of links to articles that I'm mentioning. You can find all the platforms are on just in case. Uh, and I like mentioning these, these a lot, just in case you don't see us on the mainstream platform like Twitter or Facebook or uh, YouTube or any of those. And all of a sudden we're gone. You're going to know that we're also on odyssey.com, gab TV, library.tv, brighty on bit shoot and elsewhere. Plus of course we have the podcast edition on Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Podbean, and the rest. Plus, you can find our membership program where you can put your financial faith behind our work. All that and more at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And just a quick hello to everyone out in the live chat. While I take another minute or so to allow people to get notifications to join us for the live stream, there's Rachel, Funky, Grendel, Tim Martin, Dixie Strong, Patricia Dance, uh, Jane, Tyler B, SAH, Clay Kent, Justin Morrison, Larry Clark, that Liberty gal, MRGF78, the chicken man, Dan Reed, yo, good to see you, DHD, Ernest Barreto, and everyone else. There's Floyd, and I know I'm missing a few people. I'm just trying to scroll through as quickly as I can so we can just get right to this. I got a ton of information. I apologize if I missed anybody. I will try to, if I don't get too wordy, which I already am, if I don't get too wordy, I will come back and look at some of the questions or comments in the chat and address those later. Otherwise, I do, re do reply to as many as possible, primarily on the YouTube archive, but also on Odyssey and elsewhere. If you leave some questions or thoughts, it gives me a lot of great ideas for episodes in the future. Now let's get right to this. We're talking about joint law enforcement task forces. And I've got an article here from Mike Meharry that I think sets the stage. Let me pull this up on the screen. He says, through the pro proliferation of joint law enforcement task forces, the federal government is creating a national police force that operates in a legal twilight zone with little or no oversight. And of course, little or no constitution either. Law enforcement officers, Mike writes, from various state, local, and federal law enforcement agencies make up these joint task forces. The concept evolved out of the unconstitutional war on drugs launched by President Richard Nixon. The first multi-jurisdictional task forces were put together in the 70s. I think there may have actually been some in the 60s, but in the 70s, and then you have joint terrorism task forces that started popping up in the 80s. Going further, here uh, in Forbes, but from Institute for Justice, IJ.org, uh, is a great organization, especially when it talks about things like, uh, when you're talking about things like qualified immunity or asset forfeiture or law enforcement task forces. And this is from a guy named Andrew Weimer. I apologize if I get the name wrong, Andrew. Uh, but the, here's how he put it. The number of federal state task forces has exploded in recent years. There are now more than a thousand under the direction of the U.S. Department of Justice and dozens more overseen by the Department of Homeland Security. They operate in all 50 states. Task forces, and this is one of the things when people tell me, oh, you live in California or whatever, they're like, oh, how can you deal with how bad it is under the government? Every state 
when it comes to the constitution of the federal government, the constitution for the United States and the constitution of each state is absolutely terrible. They're all participating either overtly or behind the scenes in all kinds of unconstitutional garbage. And these types of things operate in all 50 states. We're going to get into some of the reasons they're so problematic in just a few minutes. Task forces, Andrew writes, can specialize in ta tracking fugitives and targeting drug rings, gangs, or human trafficking. It sounds good on its surface. Of course, we're always sold on how they're going to protect us and they're going to get bad guys, but it never really plays out like that. One can think of the Patriot Act, how it was only going to be used for the terrorists and certainly it's used for anyone and everyone, or how the income tax was just going to be a small couple of percentage against the richest of the rich, a wartime measure, temporary. And eventually, well, we know what happened with that. Andrew goes on, he says, at any time, a local police force may have a significant number of their officers engaged in task force work. For instance, the Pensacola, Florida Police Department allowed the U.S. Marshals to de deputize a full third of its force during a 2019 operation. So basically, you know, you think you have your local police and they're out and about, but really they're acting as federal agents at that time. And Mike points that out, Meharry points that out in his story, in his article here. He says, when state or local law enforcement officers join a federal joint task force, they are deputized as federal agents. Now, if they're helping from time to time, that makes sense. And it depends what they're helping for. Most federal criminal laws on the books shouldn't exist in the first place. So helping them enforce these unconstitutional acts means they are violating the Constitution as well. And they are becoming federal agents at the time. They're temporary federal agents, and then they pop back as state or local again. As a result, Mike writes, they then operate under the exact same parameters as an FBI or a DEA agent. That means they act as if they were no longer bound by state laws. And a lot of times those state laws are far more restrictive on what law enforcement can do in comparison to what the feds authorize them to do. In practice, and Mike, this is an article in regards to how these joint task forces actually enable local law enforcement to conduct all kinds of surveillance that sometimes wouldn't even be allowed under state or local law. All they do is they do an end run around that and they say, well, we're part of a federal joint task force. So now we're federal agents. We're no longer bound by the state law restricting our activities. In practice, Mike writes, this allows local cops to ignore state laws as they collect information on people in their communities. Going further, this is from um, Simone Weichselbaum in the Marshall Project, and she puts it this way. The FBI, this is an example of how this happens. The FBI and U.S. Marshals also allow the use of deadly force if a person poses an imminent danger. This is a certain legal threshold. So FBI and U.S. Marshals, they say you can use deadly force on someone if it's considered imminent danger. This is a definition, she writes, that is less strict than many police departments around the country. California, for example, recently adopted a law stating that deadly force may only be used when necessary. That's a higher legal standard. I'm not going to get into the details of that. You can Google that or uh, start page or DuckDuckGo that and search for that online and compare how imminent danger standard under law versus necessary. So they join these uh, federal state joint task forces, and then all of a sudden they have a lower standard and they have to keep track of these things too. So maybe there's just some head dude uh, for the task force that says, now you guys can do this. Anyways, task force members, she writes, are also immune to civilian lawsuits in a way that regular officers are not. Another example here from Portland, Oregon. They actually did a report, they did a study on this, uh, I think it was released in the last couple of years, comparing how things work when law enforcement act as federal agents versus state or local agents. And they pointed out one of the, the, the implications, the first one they come up with is here. It says Oregon state laws versus federal laws. There are some differences. Oregon state law provides a higher standard of protection for civil rights than federal law. The feds actually have a very loose uh, approach to this. And it's not because the constitution for the United States in and of itself is less restrictive, 
maybe. But really, the fact of the matter is, is that through Supreme Court precedent, through federal precedent, through uh, legislation, through fiat regulation and the like, executive orders, all kinds of stuff, they're basically ignoring the Constitution on a federal level. We know this because we live under the largest government in the history of the world. A limiting document like the Constitution for the United States means it's totally being ignored if you live under the largest government in the history of the world. And certainly if you're going to follow federal rules of the empire, those rules aren't going to be really good towards the Constitution or your liberty. They go further here in Portland. They point out Oregon Statute 181.575 specifically prohibits any state or local law enforcement agency from collecting or maintaining information, and this is about surveillance, about the political, religious, social views, or associations or activities of any individual, group, or organization, unless the information directly relates to an investigation of criminal activities, and there are reasonable grounds to suspect the subject of the information may be involved in criminal conduct. So that's a higher standard than what federal law enforcement agencies are actually doing. So when Portland police or any other police around the state of Oregon participate in one of these state federal joint task forces, they start using a lower standard. And sometimes they're really not doing federal work, but they're using this as an excuse to be able to violate the state law. Going further, here from Simone, she says federal court rulings have also shielded these task forces from scrutiny. Robinson's mother, she's telling a story about how someone had some problems with law enforcement. An insurance adjuster filed a lawsuit against the task force officers using a civil rights law that says local cops can be sued for excessive force. But what happened? It Because they're part of a federal state joint task force, even if you sue someone in your local law enforcement under state law, they'll just say, well, we were, I'm a deputized federal agent. And so if you're suing me under state law, that's fine, but I'm gonna make a motion and they're gonna move this to remove this to federal court. And certainly it does go to federal court. And she goes on, she says, but a federal court judge ruled against her writing quote, other jurisdictions have held, and this court agrees that officers who are acting as part of a federal task force act under the color of federal law, not state law. Now, federal law, if they were following the Constitution, <laughs> would certainly be far more restrictive. But in practice, federal agents aren't following the Constitution many times merely by having a job for the federal government. If you're talking about agencies like the DEA or the ATF, for example, literally just working for those agencies is a violation of the Constitution in my book because the only thing that either are authorized to do under the Constitution is disband. So as soon as they act as an agent for either of those agencies, everything that they're doing is unconstitutional in the first place, but the federal courts protect them. One of the best writers on this and researchers is a guy named Radley Balco. I'm sure many of you are aware of him, but here's an article from the Post, Washington Post, quite a while ago, and he points out that legal remedies are even more elusive when you're trying to sue members of a joint task force. It's hard enough to get government courts to protect you against government agents. In fact, it's only almost impossible. It's far worse when you're trying to get federal courts to protect you from federal agents. But even on a state level, it's difficult. And Balco is right in pointing out that it's far more difficult because of the murky legal nature of these joint task forces. He say they, says they blur the lines between a state and federal agencies and thus jurisdictions. Going further, Radley writes, plaintiffs have to choose the right venue and the right legal action, and they make it really tricky for people. So if you try this lawsuit, it's very easy to get it thrown out. He says they risk having the suit tossed out if they choose badly. Literally just choosing the wrong venue for the suit means you could get it thrown out. So that's a very, very difficult thing. Meanwhile, he writes, government lawyers can try to win not only on the merits, but through procedural games, claiming whichever jurisdiction is most likely to throw the case off track. So government lawyers will say, well, if you choose one jurisdiction, then in response, the government lawyers will say, well, actually, no, that's a federal jurisdiction. They were acting as a federal agent. If you try to sue as a federal agent, then either they're going to see an easy peasy path to actually getting it thrown out in the first place, or maybe they'll just make the case. They can make the case that it's under state jurisdiction. You've chose the, you've chosen 
chosen the wrong venue. Got to start from scratch. You're in big trouble. Going further. This is from Balco's article again. This is a quote from Patrick Giacomo in the Institute for Justice. And I apologize if Patrick uh, got your name wrong there as well, but IJ does such great work on this. When you're doing research or you're reading about this, you'll often come across IJ.org in their work, their quotes, uh, their activism, etc. And Patrick says this, the government's use of joint task forces has created an accountability shell game. Federal officers police state law State officers police federal law, and both can select the state or federal law and the immunities that best suit their purposes. Now, they often, just as my own aside here, they'll often choose which one that they're working on after the fact. So they'll just wait to see if there's a problem or a lawsuit or people are raising hell about it and then just say, well, we're on this one or that one. They're not really being honest about this either, and that's a big problem. And Patrick says, thanks to the proliferation of task forces, that shell game is now being played in all 50 states. And on top of it, government attorneys will argue that offices are acting as federal agents or as state agents. And this is again, back to Andrew over at Forbes, whichever is most convenient for escaping accountability. And these guys know so well, because IJ is involved in so many lawsuits and they see it playing out. They're like, well, no, this is clearly a, a, a federal joint task force if we sue in this venue. And then all of a sudden they try to escape it by saying it's supposed to be in another. Going further, he writes, and while diligent and careful plaintiffs attorneys will try to cover all their bases, Getting a case past the procedural hurdles and before a jury is a Hail Mary pass. And that's because of so many layers and how they can switch back and forth between state and federal. Simone points out that not only just this, not even just the court situation, but they really make it hard to even just find out what's really going on. And she writes, federal authorities have made it difficult for local officials to investigate federally deputized cops. The Justice Department says a task force officer who receives a subpoena or other demand can only cooperate with the approval from the region's top federal prosecutor. Think about that. You've got people working as peace, off peace officers. That's in quotes. They're not really peace officers. They are law enforcement. Most laws shouldn't exist, both on the federal level, on a state level. We can set that aside, but they are acting as law enforcement enforcement officers rather than peace officers. And if the local law enforcement who is hired to do local law enforcement, you don't really hear about people saying you're getting hired to be a support team. It's not like you're getting hired for the National Reserve and you expect to be part of the federal force. Whether they're supposed to be there or not, there's not really a wide understanding that this is how it's playing out. You get hired as a local law enforcement officer, a local police officer, a local sheriff, and then you're getting deputized, you're working as a federal agent. And then if there's concern about this local law enforcement officer in your local community doing stuff that you don't think they should be doing, you can't even get them to cooperate with an investigation if they're part of a federal task force, unless the whole regional prosecutor for the feds says it's okay. So there's no control. These people are really becoming federal law enforcement officers for a federal national police force that never was authorized under the constitution in the first place. Going further, he, uh, she says, these requests have to be narrowly focused and the agency can quash inquiries it deems too broad. So it makes it very difficult to even investigate. Meharry puts it this way, he says this jurisdictional neverland also allows members of these task forces to escape accountability or punishment when they use excessive force, destroy property, or simply engage in sloppy police work. In practice, joint task forces can pick whichever laws, state or federal, afforded them the most power and the least accountability. That doesn't sound like a constitutional system. That sounds like an arbitrary government. The founders regularly referred to a government that changes the rules and moves things around so you don't know what to expect as an arbitrary government. An arbitrary government to the founders was the very definition of a tyranny. Mike goes further. He says, initially many local law enforcement agencies weren't even interested in getting in bed with federal cops. 
and were wary of the aggressive tactics employed by the joint task forces. So there were some New York City, Los Angeles, for example, the big cities. We shouldn't be surprised. We're all on board with this because they get loot and they get to do all kinds of other stuff. And they're pretty authoritarian, kind of like a standing military force already. But a lot of other ones around the country really weren't willing to do this. But, Mike writes, the feds used federal grants, of course, the carrot and the stick. They throw some cash. They love loot and asset forfeiture money brought to bribe reticent departments and incentivize participation. The number of joint task forces grew exponentially in the 80s and 90s. The deployment of these forces also expanded well beyond the war on drugs. Here, for example, again from Balco, and I'm citing an article where they quote him over at Mises.org. He said, by the end of the 1980s, joint task forces brought together police officers and soldiers for drug interdiction. Again, this is the war on drugs. The war on drugs, whether you think people should be using them or not, is a war on the Constitution and a war on your liberty. Balco points out that National Guard helicopters and U-2 spy planes flew the California skies in search of marijuana plants. So to, to protect us from a naturally occurring plant, we need military spy planes and military helicopters and federal state blurring the line between what constitution and what law or whatever needs to be followed, basically not following any of it, really, the original constitution for either state or federal, just to protect us from a plan. This is an embarrassment to the so-called land of the free. It's a really a major stain. Going back to Simone over at Marshall Project. Again, she reiterates how many there are today. She says about a thousand task forces nationwide operate under the direction of the U.S. Marshals, the FBI, or the DEA, according to Justice Department figures. The Department of Homeland Security, she writes, oversees at least 50 more that mix immigration and border patrol agents with local police. And Mike, in his article, Actually, I think I've got three of his articles here, but he gives an example. This is one example, a list of task forces just in the Pittsburgh area alone. There's the Anti-Terrorism Advisory Council, the Crimes Against Children Task Force, the FBI Opioid Task Force, the Greater Pittsburgh Safe Streets Task Force, J-Code, that's the Joint Criminal Opioid Darknet Enforcement Team, the Opioid Fraud and Abuse Detection Unit, the Pittsburgh Financial Crimes and Electronics Task Force, the Western Pennsylvania Fugitive Task Force, the Western Pennsylvania Violent Crimes Task Force. I mean, there's a bunch of them. And if they're always participating in these task forces, it's not that we don't want criminals, violent criminals, to be apprehended. But if they're no longer acting as local law enforcement and they can do all kinds of other stuff, and of course, we're living under the largest government in history with a bunch of laws that shouldn't exist, we can see pretty easily how this becomes incredibly problematic. Mike goes on, he says, as of 2016, the DEA itself, which shouldn't exist, I can't stop saying that, it oversaw or participated in 271 anti-drug task forces across the U.S. Through a program called Project Safe Neighborhood, they always have these great names for us, to remind us why we need them, why they're protecting us, all the good that they're doing. So this pro a program called Project Safe Neighborhood, through that, the Department of Justice ran another 86 task forces in 2018, and the FBI administers 160 violent gang task forces. Mike goes on, he says, the U.S. Marshals run another 60. The ATF, which also shouldn't exist, oversees the National Explosive Task Force and forms task forces for specific investigations. Gun control. When we get opposition to efforts to ban state and local law enforcement from participating in federal gun control efforts, we get massive opposition from unions and lobby groups that represent law enforcement, sheriff, police, etc. And they are the number one opponents to this. And it's generally because they like participating in federal asset forfeiture program. They like participating in federal task forces. They're concerned that they're going to be banned from acting as local law enforcement if they continue to participate in federal, primarily ATF and DEA task forces. They want to be able to do this to get the cash, the more prosecutions, etc. Mike goes on, according to Balco, the U.S. Attorney General runs another 18 task forces through the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force program. Now, the ACLU did some research on this in Texas, and they found that narcotics task forces 
tended to search all drivers at a much higher rate than regular police and sheriff's departments. So when they act for the uh, for the feds doing federal drug control efforts, they're actually searching people way more often. They're probably using a much lower standard. I haven't looked into it. They probably do use a much lower standard. Oh, well, this is a DEA agent. And I think a lot of people are be will be much more willing to just comply. They almost never gave tickets at traf traffic stops, even though task force officers stopped thousands of cars for alleged violations. So in this study that they did, thousands of cars were stopped supposedly for traffic violations. None of them got tickets. They're just using it as an excuse to do drug, drug searches. They say one can only conclude that the task forces are using this blanket traffic stop approach as a pretext to search for drugs and cash, which generates income for them under federal asset forfeiture law. So the money part is a big part of this as well. They go on. They say many task forces rely on seized assets from these highway interdiction programs to pay their local share under a federal matching funds program, the Edward Byrne Memorial State and Local Law Enforcement Assistance Program. State and federal laws allow these task forces to generate income from seized property. So this is asset forfeiture, which is theft. It's highway robbery. It's armed robbery. They generate income from property like vehicles and cash from persons engaged in or merely accused of illegal drug trafficking. We know that asset forfeiture, civil asset forfeiture, almost never requires someone to be convicted of a crime. And that's why it's stealing. The task forces, they say, then use the seized assets to apply for federal matching funds to finance their work. So they steal stuff. Then they say, well, we've got this amount of money that we've raised and now you can match it. And they're getting a double. So this is really, really nasty stuff, really nasty incentives as well. And Mike points out that the money and power that comes. This is Meharry again, points out that the money and power that comes when local cops partner up with the feds incentivizes local police to focus on national priorities such as the war on drugs, federal gun control, and so-called anti-terrorism efforts instead of prioritizing more routine local policing such as murder, rape, and property crime. So we know that if they're going to get twice as much money from stealing stuff and then getting federal grants to match how much they've stolen with the help of their federal partners, that will incentivize them to focus more and more time on these federal programs that shouldn't exist in the first place. So if you hire someone to be a, a police officer in Boise, Idaho, or in Los Angeles, or in Bangor, Maine, wherever, Knoxville, Tennessee, they're supposed to be act protecting the peace, keeping the peace locally. Instead, they're acting as enforcement agents for an unconstitutional series of federal programs. Mike points out that we also see, and I was getting into this on the opposition to nullify federal gun control efforts. He says, we also see the influence of these task forces in the state legislative process. Police lobbyists, and I'll tell you, it doesn't matter if it's a red state or a blue state. Police lobby organizations are probably or possibly the most effective ones out there. If the cop unions or a sheriff's association widely opposes a piece of legislation, it is almost certain to be killed in the process because a lot of people primarily on one side of the political spectrum doesn't don't they don't like being seen as anti cop. And so if the cops say, well, we need to have more gun control in, in order to enforce more drug war stuff, then people are willing to throw aside their right to keep and bear arms to help let the cops continue having more gun control just so they can get drug people. And this is what's happening right now in Missouri and elsewhere, where law enforcement lobby groups and sheriff's associations are opposing efforts to ban gun control enforcement so they can continue these federal joint task forces and enforce federal drug laws as well and get a lot of cash out of it. So Mike says we see this influence in the state legislative process. Police lobbyists often oppose warrant requirements if we're talking about surveillance. Anytime we have legislation that would ban mass surveillance, whether it's facial recognition, drone, cell site simulators, 
license plate readers and the like, especially license plate readers, because the program, the license plate tracking program that has been running on a national level for eight to 10 years now is primarily being operated by state and local law enforcement agencies. They do it without a warrant. So it's a blanket search of anyone and everyone for the so-called crime of driving. Then they're tracking where people are and they're uploading that data through fusion centers and information sharing environment to the DEA. This is a drug war program. License plate tracking is primarily a DEA program. And so they oppose anything telling them that they need to have a warrant based on probable cause, particularly describing the person, place, or thing to be searched or seized. And they don't like that. And a lot of times, and especially from one political team over the other, you'll see them pretty much crumble as soon as the cops say, this is going to let bad guys get away. Anyways, they oppose these warrant requirements, limits on state and local cooperation with federal surveillance, prohibition on state enforcement of unconstitutional federal gun control, that's, an, that's redundant, asset forfeiture reform, and other laws. And summing it up, this is how Mike puts it, and I think it's really good. He says, the federal government was never intended to exercise police powers in the first place. The Constitution only defines four federal crimes, treason, piracies, and felonies committed on the high seas, counterfeiting, and crimes against the law of nations. The federal government also has criminal jurisdiction within Washington, D.C., and its other enclaves. Everything else, everything else on a federal level that is a crime is a violation of the Constitution. Those criminal laws are supposed to be made on a state-by-state -state level. They can vary. They can oh, be totally different but it's not in, within the purview of the federal government under the delegated powers of the Constitution. And Mike says, in other words, virtually the entire federal law enforcement apparatus is a violation of the Constitution. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope you, it's educational. I hope it fired you up to oppose this kind of garbage. There are a handful of local governments that are starting to opt out of these types of task forces. We haven't tracked it very closely. I know a couple of cities have joined, uh, opt out of uh, joint terrorism task forces, but we know there's literally hundreds of task forces. And even if they only opt out of one, they're just participating in another one. So, uh, that, I think, has really got to be the path forward. If you want to catch bad guys, don't do all this end-to-run stuff around the Constitution in order to do it. It's not good. It's not good for liberty. It's not good for society. We should all know this by now. And hopefully this information will help you be more aware of what's going on. I'm learning as I go here as well. Uh, every time I do an episode on police state issues, I pick up new information and I try to share as much with you as possible. Just looking... Over at uh, the live chat, here's Grendel says they claim the plate is state property. Oh, is that that's how they get away with being able to take pictures of it. But the thing is, they're also when they do that, they're actually associating the plate with the owner of the car. They're tracking location. So they're keeping track of where people are going. They're building profiles on maybe what church they go to, what kind of protest, where they shop, where they work, who they visit. And you can build all kinds of information on people. And when the government has the power to understand, whether it's through metadata or through other tracking information like this, who is doing what? Someone, whether it's right now or some years in the future, has a very powerful weapon to crush dissent and protest. That's really, really bad news. Dale Bali says government doesn't like either the U.S. or the state constitution, without a doubt. Absolutely correct. We can see this uh, happen quite a bit. And uh, Dale, you said there's a bill up for this as well. Could you, if you get a chance over at YouTube, can you post a link to whatever bill that you're referencing? Because if I'm not on top of that, I probably should be. Grendel says feds bribe as much as the cartels in South Texas. Yeah, this asset forfeiture stuff, we're talking about billions and billions of dollars. And the cartels really are just kind of their own government as well. And the reason that the cartels are so powerful is because of the government, the government war on drugs. As soon as you make something illegal, then the only people that are going to be involved in the business uh, producing, buying, and selling, well, not necessarily the buying stuff, are people who are willing to flout the law. So that's uh, really, really helping the cartels rather than taking their power away from them. Anyways, uh, oh, Bob Brewer says, I see the first three sentences of the declaration as a litmus test for constitutionality. Well, that's interesting. I disagree uh, because uh, they're not 
the same, but I understand where you get the basis. Certainly wanting to put those principles into practice. Dale Bali says it's over on the website. Oh, you may have seen one of our pieces of legislation over there as well. I will look a little bit further at the questions in the live chat and the comments uh, and reply to as many as possible as soon as I can a little bit later today. You can also send an email my way, team at 10thamendmentcenter.com. That's all spelled out, team at 10thamendmentcenter.com. If you've got questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, if you like this information, you like the work that we're doing, please help us spread the word. Smash the like button on whatever platform you're on. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast platform. That triggers the algorithm it tells the pro platform to show the program to more people. And I'm really grateful for all the help in spreading the word. We're reaching more and more people every single month. And of course, if you want to put your financial faith behind our work, there's absolutely nothing, and I mean that, absolutely nothing that helps us get the job done, roll up our sleeves every single day, and take a stand for the Constitution and Liberty more than the financial support of our members. It starts out as $2 a month over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Please don't feel obligated to pitch in, but if you are able to do so, any uh, consideration you can give, I would be very grateful for. Again, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you had a great weekend. I really appreciate you being here, and I'll see you next time here on the Path to Liberty.